Okay, we can go ahead and get started. Sorry, I migrated outside for better Wi-Fi, and it's a nice day. Um, okay, thank you all for being here. We really appreciate you taking the time to come here and speak at this panel event and share some of your knowledge with our community. Um, we just thought that sexual health and sexuality and things like that sometimes can be a bit of a touchy subject or sensitive topic, um, especially for people with diverse cultural backgrounds and things like that. So we wanted to create this um, safe space, comfortable space um, for students to learn more about resources and different information and things like that. Um, so just a quick overview of the event agenda. We'll start with some introductions um, of all of our panelists. And then the bulk of the event will be for a discussion. So we have a few different um, discussion questions that we're gonna go through. Um, but there's no pressure for each panelist to answer each question. Obviously, um, there's a lot of you, so just feel free to jump in when you feel like you have something to add, um, and hopefully the conversation will flow naturally. Um, and then after that, we're gonna leave about 30 minutes at the end for student questions, uh, but we can see when the time comes how many student questions we have, and if we want to continue the discussion among panelists, that's fine too. Um, so for our attendees, there's a little Q&A spot. You can ask anonymous questions throughout if there's something that a panelist says that you want them to touch on again or you want them to elaborate on. So feel free to use that throughout and we will get to that um, towards the end. So just to start off, uh, the us hosts can introduce ourselves. So my name is Michelle Alexander. I uh, pronouns she, her, hers, and I'm a psychology major and an intern with the Multicultural Center. Um, my name is Alexis Montgomery, and I am a graduate student assistant at the Multicultural Center, and I'm a graduate student within Environmental Sciences. Hi, okay, everyone. My name is Natalie Zamora. Um, she, her, her pronouns. I'm a second year public health major with a minor in child development, and I'm also an intern at the MCC. Thank you. Um, okay, so panelists, if you would be able to introduce yourselves and just tell us a little bit about the work that you do and how it relates to sexual health and also just why this topic is important to you. I can go first. Um, my name is Ari. My pronouns are she, hers. I'm a third year public health major. I have a concentration in community and public health. I started working in Dr. Robert's sexual health and reproductive lab my sophomore year of uh, at Cal Poly and I started on a project that was measuring or reviewing literature on um, contraception and how self-perceived weight gain affects contraception choice. Um, I've since then worked on a few projects working under Dr. Roberts, and I'm also a peer health educator on the sexual health team for Pulse. I can go next. I'm Dr. Joni Roberts. I'm faculty in the Department of Kinesiology and Public Health and actually three people on the panel um, have worked in my lab. Um, so I don't think I need to be here. I think they could just speak on, on my behalf. Um, let's see, I, I use she, her pronouns. I um, got into sexual health um, as a result of my own um, health experiences. And so between what I encountered in healthcare, especially being um, someone who migrated to the US later in life and so interacting with the US health and my own needs and then comparing that to my colleagues, peers and family, I was like, oh, there's something here. <laughs> like we, we should be doing more, especially for um, communities of color. And so that's really how I got into um, sexual health. And so um, why is it important to me? Because it's not something we talk about. Um, it's, it's definitely a taboo um, topic. And um, I wore the shirt tonight because it's a, so DC's Department of Health has a campaign called Sex Is. And um, so it's like sex is and whatever, and so you follow them on Twitter, Instagram, whatever. 
And so that's when I love because it's like sex is communication. And I'm like, yes, it is. Because um, if you're not talking, then I don't know how you are actually like enjoying what you're enjoying or what experiences you're having. Like there has to be communication from the beginning to the end. And um, so that's why sexual health is important to me. Happy to be here. I can share. Um, hi, my name is Autumn Becker. My pronouns are she, her, hers and I am a third year public health major. I am also conducting research under Dr. Roberts for her sexual reproductive health lab. And I'm a peer educator, uh, a peer wellness educator for EROS, which is educational resources on sexuality um, under campus health and well-being. And I'm also a student representative for the KPH inclusion and equity committee. Um, sexual health is important to me because kind of like Dr. Roberts was saying, it can be stigmatized and as a result of that it can often be disregarded. Um, so I think it's important for everybody to be knowledgeable about safe practices and their options. That way they can make informed decisions in their sexual relationships. I'll go. Um, I'm, hi, I'm Elisa Gonzalez, pronouns she hers. I am the marketing and communications lead for the Eros team. I work with Ari and Autumn. Um, they're awesome. And um, I think that my experiences, my own experiences with sexual education are that growing up in Mexico, I never really had any kind of sexual education. I went there up until I was in high school and there it was not talked about topic, like a taboo topic completely. Um, a lot of my friends had similar experiences. And so I think, I just think everyone has a right to um, know about their own body and know how to communicate properly and consent and about protection. Um, and so, yeah, I'm really happy to be here. There's also like so much misinformation about sexual health out there. So it makes me really happy to work with students. Um, and then I forgot to introduce myself, but I'm a fourth year public health major, bio minor. Um, hi everyone. Uh, my name's Jack. I'm a second year sociology major at Cal Poly. Um, my pronouns are he, him, and his, um, and I'm a prevention education intern with Cal Poly Safer. Um, and so I'm here today um, because I, you know, became interested in violence prevention um, as an activist and volunteer with Safer um, my first year at Cal Poly. Um, and I really see the need in community for resources around gender and power-based violence. Um, I think that, you know, sex is a domain of our lives where um, we really see like an interpersonal, um, you know, sort of sphere of social justice. And so I really think that if we're able to create, you know, self safer relationships, we're gonna create a healthier society. Um, and so that really is the foundation of my interest and I'm really excited um, to be here. Um, I can go 100% to what Jack said. Um, my name is Janae, I use she, her pronouns. I'm the prevention education manager at RISE, which is the county's resource for sexual violence survivors, as well as people who are experiencing intimate partner violence, their friends, family, and loved ones. Um, Sexual health is violence prevention, not only because sex is communication, but also people deserve to feel agency over themselves, their bodies, their experiences, their identities, obviously. Um, well, obviously to everyone in this space. So it intertwines, it intersects so deeply. We hear that from the youth that we work with. And so in the past couple of years, we started working with CAPSLO, who is also here and can talk a lot more about this, but in implementing um, positive and affirming sexual health curriculum in the schools, along with our violence prevention programming. Yeah, hi, um, I'm Sophia. My pronouns are she, her, Aya, and I'm with CAPSLO. Um, it's a community action partnership in San Luis Obispo. So Capsula's mission altogether, they have a lot of different programs, but their mission is to help low-income individuals reach self-sufficiency. And one of the umbrellas that I work under is health and prevention. And so I work in teen programs, basically. There's a lot of um, umbrellas at Capsula. <laughs> um, and I have been teaching sexual health education in the classroom um, 
also at like alternative high schools and at juvenile services. Um, and also we have been providing more recently like more specific classes around healthy and unhealthy relationships, typically to students between the ages of 14 and 18, sometimes older, sometimes younger, it depends. Um, and sexual health is important to me, like many of you, because I'm bicultural and um, one of my cultures shames sex and the other one is really open with it. And so I grew up in two paradigms and have seen and experienced the effects in America of the stigma around sex. So um, it's really important to me. Hello, um, my name is Declan. Um, my pronouns are he, him, and I'm a student assistant in the Pride Center. Um, and I'm here to kind of just talk about um, the LGBTQ aspect of sex and sexuality. Um, you know, LGBTQ um, students have, you know, in addition to navigating many of the um, things about changing bodies and, and communication, have a whole nother set um, of of things to navigate, including um, coming out um, and navigating gender identity. And so just to kind of bring that aspect in um, and talk about, you know, that aspect, but also how students other identities um, play into their sexuality um, and gender identities. Did everyone get a chance to introduce themselves? Um, hi, my name's Olivia. I, I joined a little late. Um, I'm a fourth year. Um, I'm a journalism major and I have not like taught anybody about like sexual health, but I have, um, I mean, I have, I do have some knowledge on it, but I'm willing to learn today more. So, yeah. Cool. Thank you all for sharing a bit about yourselves. I think we have a great um, set of different perspectives. So I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Um, okay, we can go ahead and jump right into our discussion. So some of you touched on this a little bit already, but if you anyone wants to elaborate, um, what drew you to this work with sexual health? And on this one, feel free to share a bit about your personal experience if you feel comfortable. Um, I can share. So before I joined Eros, I saw some of the programs that Pulse was putting on for their Love Carefully campaign. And they hosted events in common spaces of campus, such as the library fish bowls. And I thought it was a really great way to start conversations among students. And then once I became a peer wellness educator, um, the opportunity to collaborate with Dr. Roberts for her SRH lab, um, was introduced to us. And I thought it was a perfect way to assess the specific needs of Cal Poly students, um, the specific sexual health resource needs of them. So specifically right now, we're working on another student senior project and we're examining um, the sexual health knowledge, attitudes and beliefs and condom usage of Cal Poly students. Um, I would imagine that this experience might be shared by some people who receive sexual health uh, curriculum or the lack thereof in high school. My interest in sexual health came from not learning about it in high school. I got a very heteronormative um, absence only education in a rural area. Um, and I saw the impacts that that had on myself and all of my friends when I was really young. And then moving from that rural area up to Portland and being exposed to a different perspective, working with our pride and gender equity center. And then with Planned Parenthood, it was always something that I really loved, um, but saw it kind of in a two dimensional silo as sexual health is just sexual health. And then moving into the social services arena and being able to explore, speak on, and learn a lot more about the intersections in other well-being and social justice and how sexual health and people learning about their bodies, learning about their themselves, empowers them to live 
lives that they are entitled to or that they should be entitled to um, has been a really beautiful experience. So I'm hoping to keep weaving it through whatever I do. So I would say that my um, background with sexual health began in um, my upbringing in a very conservative religious home. Um, which is amazing. We just didn't talk about it, not because we were religious or conservative, just culturally in the islands, we don't talk about it. Um, so it was just one of those things that like, I've always like, so um, no one's gonna talk about this. Like we just, like I remember when I came to the US and I was finishing high school, I think the first day I went to school in the US, my mom was like, don't come home pregnant. And I was like, and how does that happen? It was, it was like silence and I was like great great talk um I was like okay there's something wrong here and I think especially from my um conservative religious religiosity um background like I would talk to peers who were very conservative um and I'm as liberal as it gets um and so when I talk to my peers I mean they love all my nonsense but I would have conversations about sexual health and it was always fascinating to me I remember I had a conversation with my, a girlfriend who like I was her maid of honor and it was like two nights before her wedding and I was like so um what's gonna happen you know when y'all get married and she's like what do you mean what are we talking about and I was like stop this can't be a thing like <laughs> we gotta unpack this and I was like are you using condoms what, what are we doing she was like, um, I guess he has a condom. You guess, like, we don't know. Like, I was like, what's, what's wrong with this story here? And I remember we were talking and I was like, so um, I need you to check that the condom hasn't expired. And she was like, I'm sorry, condoms expired. And I was done. I was done. I was like, okay, you're a grown woman. This is not okay. Um, and, and I mean, before coming here, I taught in the South. So I'm very familiar with um, limited education in schools and what students get access to and what they don't get access to. But I think especially when I look at um, migrant populations, especially for cultures that are not like they're either first or second or maybe not like the first generation here, right? Like, um, and so they're battling two cultures, right? Their home culture and now the US. And it's like, well, how, how do we navigate these conversations? Like, and even the whole topic of like, because I grew up with like sex is for procreation. And I was like, oh, that's cute. Um, so like, that's really what drew me to it because I was, I wasn't having it. Like from a really young age, I just thought there was something wrong with it. And um, people entertained me. So I continued to go down the path. I kind of have a similar backstory to everyone that just went in front of me. I grew up in a pretty conservative household when it came to sexual health. The most I would get out of my parents are don't be stupid, but there was never clearly a definition for stupid other than just like don't come home pregnant or else, you know, but I mean, that was pretty much it. And then between like my senior year of high school, as well as my freshman year of college, I my sexual health was just probably the unhealthiest I've, I could have ever let it get. And I couldn't find any good information out there that would support me and what I was going through my personal experiences. And I eventually, after reading more about Pulse, going to more of their events my freshman year, I started learning more for myself. And I was like, I need to know more about the resources in my community, as well as trying to find a place for me to be able to provide those resources to my peers. Because a lot of my friends that I would talk to about sexual health didn't really know anything about like the resources that we had available to us in SLO either. And I just thought that was a huge hole in our knowledge, um, despite you know how many times you hear about it in like WOW or any freshman orientation program, nothing really sticks until you really are just chatting one-on-one -on -one with your friends and they're like, oh, go check this out, which is even though you've heard it five times before, just doesn't stick as well as when a friend talks to you about it. So I just really wanted to get involved and be in a place where I could help other people that were kind of going through similar situations as I was to just find what they need to get better sexual health. <laughs> um, so I kind of work at, at the Pride Center. We work in um, you know a broad variety of LGBTQ issues. 
Um, but one of the issues that we kind of see a lot um, is students coming to college not having had um, sex education, especially when LGBTQ. Um, many of them may have even had a what might be called progressive sex education where they talk about condoms and and contraception and those kinds of things but most students on a whole say that se sexual health especially is very heteronormative um, and even when it does touch into the LGBTQ issues it very rarely touches into the issues of gender um, and the complexities of gender um, and so something that we're working on is trying to conduct um, inclusive sexual education courses um, as the Pride Center so students on campus can be like, I'm going to go attend this course so I can understand what it's like um, and how I can protect myself as a queer member of this, of, um, you know, the slow community. Um, and so I kind of have gotten into the sexual health aspect of things um, by just really noticing the lack of queer um, centric sexual health education. Um, as I was saying earlier, I felt safer my first year um, after volunteering. Um, sort of through meeting that you know, experiential knowledge in community organizing and it, it really change um, and so that area you know again I think we can move on to the next question and we'll see um, if can you hear me now we can hear you now. You're kind of cutting in and out a little um, bit. I don't know if my audio is working right now. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna move on to the next question. Um, how would you recommend okay. folks? Um, Okay, well, we can move on and maybe my internet will improve. Okay. So our next question is, how would you recommend folks talk with their partners about using contraception of any kind? What, or what about getting tested? Um, I can talk a little bit about this. So I have a fun flow chart, but I don't know how to like, I don't think I could probably, can I share my screen, Michelle? Um, I think I can give you capabilities. Hang on. Okay. I mean, it's not a huge deal, but. Um, okay. this oh, actually you should be able to, if you want to try. But okay. if not, you can always share it. Out. Oh, yeah, there we go. Perfect. Is it? <laughs> um, okay. Well, this is kind of a fun flow chart I've shown to students in the past, um, starting off the conversation with consent. And, um, you know, if the answer is yes to do you want to have sex, cool. When's the last time you were tested? And then, you know, you can kind of see, like, I don't know, never. Okay, let's wait. Um, or recently, okay, what birth control um, safe sex methods do you use? Like other good questions are, um, what do you have anything to tell me about your body? What have you used in the past? How has that worked for you? And coming to an agreement together can be helpful. 
um, so that, you know, sometimes the onus isn't just on one person or the burden isn't just on one person. Um, and then there can be questions around boundaries and limits of, around someone's body um, that can also be helpful. So that was just kind of a short thing I wanted to share because I thought it was kind of cute. Um, but also, like if two people want to have sex, whether or not they're in a monogamous relationship, going to get tested together can always be a fun way of building trust. Um, and then in terms of accessing contraception in San Luis Obispo, I'm sure you are all going to hear about the clinics in our town, but Planned Parenthood and the center in San Luis Obispo and Arroyo Grande offer something called FPACT, which is a free, basically, insurance card that is totally confidential. And, um, you know, someone doesn't have to reveal their status, like citizenship status in the States. They don't have to reveal uh, much about themselves, just they want to see that you make less than $2,000 a month. And, um, you can receive testing, contraception, pregnancy testing, health exams, and more for free at those clinics. Um, I also wanted to recommend the resource of bedsider.org. Um, sometimes people like that for contraception and being able to read about different um, birth control methods. And sometimes people have like their experiential stories with different birth control methods. But um, really what it comes down to is being able to be honest with your healthcare provider. If, you know, if someone was at Planned Parenthood or the center, because some birth control methods work better than others depending on your lifestyle. Um, so for example, if someone smokes, you know, they might um, recommend one birth control method than the other. So at least when I'm talking to high schoolers, I know y'all aren't high schoolers, but I'm always like, they're not gonna get you in trouble. You just gotta be as honest as possible so they can recommend um, the best thing for you and making sure you ask any questions or bring up any concerns. And it was cool to hear Autumn or Ari about the, the perceived weight gain with um, birth control. Maybe y'all can talk about that too, because that is something that comes up for a lot of people when they look for contraception. Also knowing your own allergies, you know, knowing if you have a latex allergy, et cetera, when it comes to condoms. Thank you for sharing, Sophia. I love that little visual. That's a great um, way to look at it. And that kind of honestly goes into our next question. So if people have more to add to talking, uh, the topic of like talking about your partners, feel free, but it kind of ties into this next one, which is with so many contraception options out there, how can students find the best one for them and how can they access them? Yes, I think Sophia mentioned a really great resource um, just now, bedsider.org. Um, it's one of my favorite ones to recommend. But I think uh, first and foremost, it's important that you know yourself and what you want. Like I think too many times we enter into these spaces and we expect someone else to tell us what we want or need or desire. Um, and we can't do that, right? Like you have to come to the table with something. So whether that's contraception or a partner or pleasure, whatever it may be, I think it's important that you know yourself. And so if you're deciding to go on a method, then you need, you first need to ask yourself why you're getting on this method. What is it that you're trying to accomplish? Um, and then start looking at those types of methods, right? And then go to your healthcare provider and have those discussions. Too many times people show up and they're like, I just want to be on birth control. Just give me something. And it's like, that's not really how this works. Um, so I think the best thing is like to start with sort of an introspective reflection, right? Like, what is it that I want? What am I trying to accomplish here? Because if you're not ready to have that conversation, you're not ready for anybody to be inside of any holes you have. Like, that's just where we are. I think something also important to bring up is that. Um, for um, especially with queer people, um, contraception is more than like birth control. And so um, that especially amongst the queer community, um, HIV is still something that is um, a concern amongst many people, regardless of gender identity. Um, and that there are, it's important to, you know, even if, you know, there's 
you know, quote, biologically no chance of like pregnancy or, or, and you're not worried about those things, um, it's still important to use um, protection and practice safe sex methods um, because they're beyond HIV, there are a plethora of sexually transmitted diseases um, that um, we all want to work to be prevented because it's not, it's not fun to have those. Um, and so just especially promoting the use of PrEP. Um, I just like want to talk on PrEP for a second, which is available um, if you go to your, you know, your primary care physician and they'll have a, a talk and you can discuss if that's something um, that's right for you. And it is a very expensive medication as well. Um, and there are different ways um, to help if you can't afford that. And I think there might be some other people in the panel who um, might have know of some other resources. Um, but at the Pride Center, we recommend um, when people are trying to um, find PrEP that Gilead Pharmaceuticals, the company that runs um, PrEP, actually has a program where you can sign up and they will give you, um, I believe, free or reduced discounted prices. Um, and if any panelists want to double check those facts, that'd be awesome. Yes, I can attest to that. Gilead um, does provide resources, um, especially if you are a person of color or from a marginalized group. Um, but yes, they do go out of their way to um, provide you the resources you need. Um, I do have a follow up question. Do you all also um, recommend PEP or only PrEP? We mostly talk about PrEP just because um, that's a lot of people come to ask to us before they're um, getting um, you know, involved sexually, it's a lot of times when people are just like, I have literally no idea what contraceptive methods I should use, and, and PrEP, PEP, excuse me, um, is also something that definitely is to be, should be used. Um, and for those who don't know the difference between PrEP and PEP, I should kind of say those. Um, PrEP is pre-expository prophylaxis, which you take on a daily basis um, throughout your time that you're going to take it, and it reduces your risk of contracting HIV. Um, and PEP is post-expository prophylaxis, which um, can reduce your risk of developing um, HIV after um, a potential exposure to um, HIV. And so to get um, PEP, you would have to see a licensed um, doctor. So Planned Parenthood is somewhere you can get it. You can get it the um, the, I don't know if you can get it on campus at the Health and Wellness Center, um, and there are other clinics um, around that will help, and also just a general practitioner doctor um, can, can do that too, and, and those are some, some resources. I'm so glad you brought that up. Thank you for jumping in, and I also, now you're making me think at Planned Parenthood, um, the four core that they like to test for, um, and sometimes, depending on the clinic, you have to ask specifically, but typically Planned Parenthood likes to test most people for HIV, syphilis, gonorrhea, and chlamydia. Um, and there are high-ish rates. I mean, like the rates of HIV in our community, at least in the last couple of years, have gone up. Um, but the great thing about the HIV test is it's a little finger prick and it takes 15 to 20 minutes um, and it's free. So at those clinics with the f packed card. I would, uh, if it's okay. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Declan. Okay, I don't wanna go too off track, but I did want to plug Eros really quick and saying there are so many different options um, for contraception. And I think the first step is definitely learning about all the different ones. So the hormonal methods, the barrier method, methods and emergency contraception. And if it seems really scary, you can look, we have presentations on that. We can do live presentations upon request, or we have a recording or a video we could just send you or a PowerPoint presentation. Um, it's definitely important for students to do their own research, figure out what works best for their own bodies. But if they need a starting point, we can help as a beginning resource. And um, so then students can essentially make a pros and cons list of what fits best for them. And I also wanted to touch back really quick on um, bringing up the conversation of using contraceptives right before, well, you know, and ideally it'd be great to have this kind of conversation before a sexual act is going to take place, but it's better to have it 
right before sex than to not have the conversation at all. Um, so we recently had a presentation on Let's Talk Sex, and we talked a lot about um, COVID safety and having sex and dating during a pandemic and how to make it as safe as possible. And we found that there were a lot of, a lot, a lot of parallels about talking about COVID safety and talking about using protection during sex. So a lot of it is about having conversations in advance and setting expectations about, hey, have, how many people have you been seeing? And have you been taking COVID seriously? Have you gotten tested? These are a lot of the same questions about when you're talking about safe sex, you know? So now we're asking about two kinds of testing. And I think that we've been having these conversations with our housemates, with our friends, and with whoever else we decide to spend time with during this pandemic. And I think it's really great practice for setting barriers. Um, so I think, yeah, I think that's something you can take into consideration when you're thinking about seeing someone sexually. Another thing that it's making me think about too, along the lines of healthy and unhealthy relationships is I often tell students, because some students have asked me, you know, how can I bring up testing without my partner being offended? Um, and kind of as Dr. Joni Roberts said, it's like, if you're not ready to have that conversation, you're not ready to have sex, first of all. Also, how someone reacts to a boundary, just in general, in our relationships can be a huge indication of whether or not someone is healthy for us. So I know, you know, in high school, it can be a little different, but especially now in college, and if you're trying to have those conversations and someone is offended or trying to kind of shift blame a little bit and saying like, why would you ask me that? Do you think you have an STI? What are you afraid of? Like, what are you saying about me? Those are huge red flags about how someone um, might be able to communicate. Um, if I were to, oh, sorry. Oh, um, I was just gonna add, like, um, I really love all this conversation about boundary setting and communication because from a violence prevention perspective, that's exactly um, what we talk about and what we're thinking about in terms of like those interpersonal intimate relationships. And I would add to um, just something we've been noticing in the community of trend is um, what's called stealthing. Um, and that's when someone agrees to use a contraceptive, like a condom um, and in the middle of the sexual encounter they either remove it or not use it and don't inform the other partner um, and so that kind of you know is a way that we see um, this sort of um, issue intersect with violence so just thought I'd mention that just to add on to that, um, like if you're ever concerned about what your partner is going to think or how they're going to react, um, something that my friends and I always tell um, folks is, so chlamydia doesn't show up and say, hi, I'm in this host, right? Gonorrhea doesn't say, hey, before, before you let me come in, just want you to know I'm here. Um, so you have to take care of you. And while um, the conversation may be challenging, while the response may be hard to deal with in the moment, you are the only advocate you have for yourself. No one else is gonna take care of you. And so it's very important, especially if you are able to get pregnant, um, tell people all the time, sperm and eggs, they have one job, it's to find each other. They don't care if you're ready, they don't care if this was an oops, they got one job. You open the door, they're going to do their job. Um, so you can either let them do their job or you can plan for ways that it makes it difficult for them to do their job. Right? Either way, have the conversation and be prepared because not having the conversation and not being prepared, like I've put in the chat, there are worse things than pregnancy. When those things occur, the conversation becomes so much more difficult to have, right? Because now it's like, oh, like I didn't have that conversation before and now I'm in this position. So do everything you can to protect yourself because you are your greatest advocate and you're the one who lives with the outcomes, right? Whatever those outcomes are, you have to live with it every day. 
And, you know, also going off of that, I hear a lot from youth that I work with and even from friends my age where they say, yes, that's all great, but I feel too intimidated to have that conversation because I'm not an expert. I'm not all of you. I don't know the names of all the STIs and, and I don't know what to say and I don't know where the places to go are and that's okay. It is unfortunately the culture that we live in um, and even and a lot of us are actively fighting against it. So everyone in this space is, but it's okay to fumble through it and giggle through it and figure it out as you go. Google is a thing. It's really, you know, it's, it's okay to not know all the things right away. What Autumn was saying, I love that comparison to COVID because COVID has become woven into our everyday language and that's awesome. And we would love for sexual health to be that way. And just because it's not, doesn't mean that we can't open that door. And kind of going off of what Sophia said as well, whether your sexual relationship is a short-term relationship or a long-term relationship, communication is going to continue. And so it's really lovely and valuable to open that door at the beginning and say, I'm not going to know how to communicate everything, but that communication is important. And I'm saying that now. Um, I also, going off of what Janae was saying, in relationships, no matter if it's just a one-time thing or if you're in a relationship with a person, like things change sometimes. And so sometimes you're, you might not want to change your birth control method or you might not feel comfortable. And it goes back to consent too and what you feel comfortable with. And so I think that it's important to have those conversations present in your relationships every day. Um, so no matter what the nature of the relationship is. Um, yeah. I wanted to bring back the conversation just to one thing that I forgot to mention that I think is really important, if you all don't mind, which is I was talking about PrEP and PEP, and I just wanted to make sure that everyone knows that it's that's not should not be your primary choice of HIV and um, STI prevention because one, it only protects against HIV. Um, it does not protect against gonorrhea, syphilis, or any of those other things. Um, and and secondly, it's I don't know the numbers, um, but it is not any, it's not close to 100% effective. Um, so especially with um, PrEP, you have to take it every day. So if you miss one, it can be less effective. So using something like condoms or um, the condoms are probably the safest, um, but barriers of protection um, for people depending on sexual, um, you know, gender identity and all those things. So I just wanted to kind of bring that in. Thank you, Declan, for clarifying that. Um, okay, we can move on to the next question, I think. So what are some gaps you are seeing in resources for the BIPOC community when it comes to sexual health? I can tackle this one. Um, a major gap that we see is lack of um, culturally relevant information. Um, so many people within uh, this community have a lot of, there's a lot of stigma because of what they've heard and also what they've experienced or others have experienced. And we haven't gotten to a place yet in our healthcare system where we believe folks um, so we promote a lot of sexual health products, especially um, contraceptive products. Um, but if someone chooses that they don't want a particular product anymore, especially if that product is a lark, it becomes very challenging for BIPOC folks. Um, and there's a lot of data on that where we've literally had providers refuse to um, remove a method. And so then that places folks with limited options if they can't really explore what they want to with the, the autonomy and the freedom they'd like. Um, also, there's, thank you for that, Sophia. Um, there is also misconceptions or perceptions of what is okay for someone else, right? So this is part of the reason why we discussed um, using sites like bedsider.org 
to sort of learn about your options beforehand because it's not uncommon, especially for those within the BIPOC community to show up at a clinic and to only hear about a handful of options, right? Like they don't hear the full um, range because whomever is communicating with you already has some perceptions about what you should be using or what you shouldn't be using. And um, oftentimes, especially if you're younger, you're in a place of dependency, right? Like you, you as um, Jenny had mentioned before, you're not an expert, so you don't want to sort of like contradict or say no. And so you just sort of go along with what is recommended, even if that recommendation is not best for you. Um, so that's some of the gaps that we see. Um, other gaps are that there aren't enough people of color, right, within this space. So youth don't feel comfortable talking, um, even as an adult, like, there are only certain people I'm going to talk to because I don't want to have the argument with you. Like, I don't, and I, I do this for a living, right? Like, I, I just don't want to get into the back and forth with you. Um, so that lack of workforce also is a barrier for young people then to sort of engage in this conversation, especially if they're not having it in safe spaces at home or in their community to then go into a space where they don't feel like they can connect or um, have things in common with their provider that makes it harder for them to access those resources. I want to echo what you said. Um, a lot of what my pre kind of notes I took is pretty much what you said. Um, I think just a sidebar, I think there needs to be a lot more period education, like menstrual education in our community as well. But um, on top of what you're saying about lack of diversity in staff around here, you know, we work in the Santa Maria school district sometimes, and those schools are majority white teachers with the majority Latinx population of students. Um, and I've seen a lot of white supremacy at play there and I've seen teachers not be held accountable. So I think that's one of the biggest barriers in someone's education. And on, I get really heated up because I've seen some horrible things, but um, there's also a barrier in terms of how many monolingual students I've seen in these schools have no aid. Um, so just only speak Spanish or maybe another language and have no aid in the classroom. Um, I've literally taught a, a sex ed class bilingually on the spot before <laughs> because of that. Because I was like, well, there's no aid. I'm going to literally do this as a sex ed Spanish class. Um, and yeah, there's just not enough support in those cases. I think also just the home environment that like a lot of BIPOC students grow up in and like the religious culture that can also play a role around that. Like, for example, for myself, like I was never really taught to like how to advocate for myself and my own sexual health um, and just talk to providers that like are usually going to be um, or not understand like my experiences and like my lack of previous knowledge about sexual health. Um, I think that's also a major barrier, just a lack of general knowledge about where to go, what resources to use, um, because just because of the home environment and the kind of taboo around sets and just having the open conversation about it. Kind of building off the, the home environment, I think um, at least for myself personally, I grew up um, in a, kind of a dual culture environment, um, having a part white family and also Latinx family, where it's kind of, it, there's lots of cultural clashes, especially around sex and um, sexuality, because, you know, there's, there's different opinions and views that are sometimes contradictory um, that you're taught about. Um, when it comes to sex and sexuality, and so it can be very confusing and a lot of people um, that I've talked to that also grew up and have experienced that um, kind of have many questions because they've heard completely contradictory things at home um, from just two different parents um, having different backgrounds. And just acknowledging the 
cultural and historical space that we're sitting in and the impact that that has. This comes up all the time with sexual assault and domestic violence is, you know, close your eyes, think of a sexual assault survivor. Are they a cisgender heterosexual white woman? Yeah. Is that because this movement was started by cisgender heterosexual white women? No, that's because it was co-opted. And I think the same goes around a lot of sexual health issues that, you know, we can do everything that we can to change that now, but we are fighting against decades of a narrative that doesn't reflect the people that live here, that recreate here and that need our services. And similarly, um, BIPOC and LGBTQ plus folks are impacted by abusive relationships um, at higher rates, oftentimes because of the barriers of white supremacy in general. But you know, things like not being able, not feeling safe to be able to speak out, and other factors. Our next question is, what resources do you have to specifically address the full spectrum of genders and sexualities? So um, within SAFER, um, I work within the prevention education branch, um, but also our other branch is, um, you know, the advocacy branch. Um, and that's where we have things like crisis intervention, accompaniment to Title IX, um, and things of that nature. Um, and so within that, we really um, emphasize trauma-informed care. And that means, you know, really recognizing and acknowledging um, social trauma and social oppression in a survivor's experience. Um, and so really um, thinking about intersect survivorship, um, opening up all of our resources so that they truly address the specific needs of um, queer and gender non-conforming people. And it's one top priority that's safer. Um, within, you know, intra-organizationally, we do continuing education about issues in um, the LGBTQ community. Um, and so that really is one of our top um, priorities. Um, I, I just want to bring up that LGBTQ Campus Life, um, we, we offer meetings with our lead coordinator. Um, so for anyone who is interested in and has questions or wants resource connections, um, we offer those. Um, and so we also do conduct queer sex ed um, on a pretty much quarterly basis. Um, so people can always check out our Instagram um, and we'll have posts about when we'll be conducting a queer sex ed um, so people can get the information that they would, they need. Okay, um, just wanna make a quick note that it is almost five. We don't have anything in the Q&A box. So I think we're just gonna continue with our discussion questions if that's okay with everyone. You all are on a roll. So <laughs> thank you so much for all this valuable information so far. Um, and just a reminder to the attendees to use um, the Q&A if you have any questions and we'll be sure to get to those before 5.30. So moving forward, our next question is, why is educating about consent important? How have we seen issues of consent manifest within marginalized communities? Um, many of us uh, have full-time jobs talking about consent because people struggle with it so much and it is impacting and hurting so many people. Um, every time that I talk about consent in middle schools and high schools, there is always that misconception that it's contractual. People get really scared of talking about consent. They think that we're robots about consent, and so they don't navigate it. And they also don't know how to obtain affirmative consent on an ongoing basis. Um, we, like Sophia mentioned, BIPOC people, LGBTQ people experience violence at much higher rates than their white cis hetero peers. 
Um, and yeah, consent has to be woven into every conversation and consent isn't inherently sexual. People think that you, the only time you're obtaining consent is when you're trying to have sex with someone or engage in any kind or in some kind of sexual act with someone. And that's not the case. Consent is about living. Consent is about relationships. It's about platonic relationships and romantic relationships. Right. Um, and I also think too that broadening our definition of consent to, um, you know, intimately recognize um, that consent exists within a history of colonization. We live in a country where, you know, the autonomy over people's bodies, over their lives, self-determination has been robbed from them. Um, and so it's really important to see how that manifests in the sexual violence that we see, who's disproportionately affected by this today. Um, I don't know if my internet's unstable, but, um, and so really making that connection to autonomy, freedom, um, even on in like, you know, an epistemic spiritual level and reclaiming that and weaving that sort of discussion into our topic of consent, I think brings a powerful perspective to preventing violence. Um, and so, yeah. I've often asked students, you know, what are the things our parents have taught us to be over our, our life, you know, kind, compassionate, um, nice to others, giving, et cetera. But for some reason, when it comes to sex in our specific culture, um, there's a disconnect there. You know, I've had students list out every word they can think of for sex. And when they think of things like banging and smashing and those types of words, I mean, pretty much 90% of the list is aggressive and doesn't have a connotation of sex. It has a really violent connotation. So I think in our culture, there's a specific disconnect of how we're raised to be with other people, except for when it comes to sex and being intimate. And it shows up in our language so much. And yeah, now that I'm seeing the chat too, it's making me think of like, even for a lot of us culturally and probably for most people, like how many times were we told, oh, go hug uncle so-and-so, go kiss them. You don't get to say no to me. Um, you know, my partner's mom fosters a baby and she's now just saying, don't touch me. And um, sometimes her foster mom will be like, what, you don't get to say that to me, but it's good. I'm like, no, she's developing boundaries now. And at a young age, we're already told like, we're not allowed to have our own physical boundaries. I just want to add, because when we think about consent, we do tend to um, think about the negative side, right? That it's correlated with um, violence or like this aggressive behavior, but violence is beyond physical, right? Like, so violence is also emotional. It's also spiritual. It's mental. Um, and I think once we start to look at the entire umbrella, we'll start to see the role that um, consent plays because again yes we do tend to think that oh consent is like oh well I, I'm okay with it if someone so touches me or I'm okay with this and I was like great are you okay with them taking advantage of you are you okay with them speaking to you a particular way um, and I, I, I think oftentimes that's part of the dialogue that folks on aren't having right like they're not familiar with that because we only think of it in these narrow lines as Sophia mentioned right like because sex has become this event <laughs> um, versus this intimate experience that it was meant to be with your partner. It, it, we've lost all of these things. This is why we're not having conversations about consent or we're not having conversations about contraception. We're not having conversations about pleasure or any of these things, because why would we? Like, we're just here um, for an event. And then once the event is over, we'll go our separate ways. And like, that was great. Um, so I think until we sort of like shift the narrative completely on what this whole process is and the intimate nature of it, then we're going to continue to lose folks in this conversation about consent. 
Yeah. And speaking on shifting the narrative, I mean, how much are scare tactics a part of all of sexual health and consent? You know, you must do this or this negative consequence will happen to you. We don't talk about the positive impacts of being healthy and about communicating. Um, I had something else that I was going to add to that, but that was it. Basically, yeah. <laughs> So our next question, um, we've answered pieces of it, so I'm going to rephrase it. Um, so a lot of times um, cultures consider sex taboo. How would a college student educate themselves? Um, I think like in the circumstances that like they grew up in a context where sex is taboo about safe practices, especially if this is a sensitive um, topic for them. I would just like to say, I think not to to our own horn, but Pulse is a really great entry point into um, just learning about general sex education. Like right now we have YouTube videos of our general presentation that we would normally give to um, health classes that um, just has really good general information. It's nothing too intimidating where you feel like you're just getting all this information and you feel overwhelmed, but it's just a really good insight on what healthy relationships are, why like you should try to conduct your life with healthy relationships, whether sexual, platonic, anything. We also have information on like contraception. And I mean, coming from a household where it is taboo to talk about sex, I my sex practices were so unhealthy. And watching these presentations, learning about it in classes just helped so much because that was just like a safe space where I was getting just really general information to get my foot through the door. And then as I became more comfortable with these topics, I felt okay talking about it with doctors or even at Planned Parenthood too, where like the nurses were just so supportive and willing to answer any questions I had. And also just general internet searches and knowing what is a reliable source and what's not a reliable source. Yeah, also polls. Um, I think for me, it was also like kind of like my first big exposure, like in college to like comprehensive sexual education. And I think for a lot of people, because before COVID, we gave presentations in classrooms and it was so surprising to see. I remember like the kind of questions people had and you could tell that a lot of people were um, just very thankful for the information and kind of like they were actually learning a lot and it was their first time hearing about a lot of things um, just regarding consent or different methods of contraception and all the topics that we talk about typically. And I also think that it's helpful to hear the information from another peer um, another college student that is your age and maybe like understands similar experiences that you have gone through. So I think before I touch on college students, I think it's important that we talk about the fact that adults struggle with talking about sex. Because <laughs> I think we think it's only a, a young people thing because if no one ever had the conversation as a young person and then you grew up into an adult, guess what? You still don't have the conversation. And it's not just a pre-marriage thing, like folks aren't talking about sex in marriage, right? So, <laughs> so like it's across the board, right? Um, I, given living in the US, right? Um, when I look at my research outside of the US, it's a different conversation, but given residing in the US, there's no excuse why you shouldn't have information. There's way too many resources, whether or not they're in your backyard or not. There are organizations across the US where you can find information. Um, I loved that Elisa said, talk to your peers. The caveat I would put is talk to your peers who have this information. I am sick and tired of folks talking to their peers and getting misinformation. Um, or, you know, they're like, oh, no, I heard this. And I'm like, where'd you hear that? And I'm like, stop, like, stop that conversation immediately. Um, because that's how a lot of this gets perpetuated, right? Like we, somebody says one thing and we're like, yeah, that makes sense. And we continue it. Um, but also, I think if you want to know, start by doing a random search. I don't care if the search is good, bad, or mediocre do a random search, right? Find everything that's out there. And then I want you to pick one thing 
and go to one consenting adult and just be like, I have a question about this. And, and I don't care if they're squirm. I don't care if they're like, you shouldn't be doing this. I don't care what they say. Just have the conversation. Pretend it's an interview, right? It's an assignment. You're like, hey, so I read this thing. And I'm just curious what this is about. Um, because I found even like when I do research with married couples, like I've had to change the way I promote certain products because it's seen as, oh, I don't need this because I'm in a consensual relationship. And I was like, uh-huh. That's what a lot of people think until it burns when they pee. Um, so let's let's just all <laughs> engage in the dialogue together and start looking at what's available out there, right? Like we've dropped a lot of resources in the chat um, for you to review on Polly's campus. Ari mentioned already, there's a lot of great resources available on campus, but there are also people you can talk to, right? Like if come talk to me if you can't find somebody. Um, but there are folks around, <laughs> Ari's not in her head. I, my conversations may be very, very blatant, um, but we're gonna have fun in the conversations. But the point of the matter is use the resources you have, right? Like use social media, use the internet, use the, um, the trusted adults in your life, whether or not those adults are people who are related to you or not but engage in those conversations. And even again, if you have to use it as an interview, like you can even lie, but like it's for an assignment, I don't care how you get the information, get the information. And then once you get it, then you can process what you do with it. But it's very important that you are seeking out these resources. And there are so many different kinds of resources and different ways to get this information. Um, and it's not like you do a search and you do reading for two days or you have a conversation and then you're like, great, check that off. I am a healthy sexual being and I will be for the rest of my life. We all continue to learn all the time. And whether it's a book or it's a podcast or um, I'm a big stand-up fan and my favorite comedian, Cameron Esposito, does a special called Rape Jokes. There are so many ways you can get this information. Maybe that's not the only way, but to remember that integrating it into your life as you live and your perspectives change and you learn more about yourself is also sexual health. Um, I'm sure uh, some of the, I don't know if this is my thing to do, but there is a question in the Q&A um, that. Yeah, thank you, Sophia. Yeah, I don't know, I was like, did I only get that? Okay. No, 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 no worries. Here, I can, we can move on to that one to make sure that we get to it. So um, someone just said, could we maybe talk more about passive sexual violence, such as coercion or slow boundary pushing in relationships? So if anyone wants to go ahead and answer that live, that would be great. I think there's a huge misconception around what sexual violence looks like um, from perpetration to survivors to the way that it actually happens. Um, and so often sexual violence as well as intimate partner violence is deeply intertwined with coercion and manipulation. Abusers know what they're doing um, and they know how to groom people. So whether that's things like gaslighting, whether they cross over a boundary and you try to speak up for yourself and they make you feel like you ruined the mood or you make them feel not appreciated or you turn them off um, or blaming you and shaming you for certain things over time. If something feels icky to you inside, that's a signal that it's not okay. And oftentimes when we're in intimate spaces with people and they're telling us something different, we tend to listen to them. We've, I'll, I'll, so many of us have been there. Um, but if you're talking about healthy relationships and you're talking about abuse, it's, it's pretty much, it's very rarely black and white. I think yeah. the hardest, um, oh yeah, go Jack. Oh no, no problem, you can go ahead. Well, I, I was just going to say something short, which is, I think the hardest part about the slow boundary pushing is that sometimes you think you gave consent because there was a slow progression. Um, and that's what abusers rely on is you blaming yourself. I think that can be the most, that can be one of the most confusing things for survivors 
is you don't know um, whether, yeah, it takes, I think, some education to, to understand like what happened, you know, was it sexual assault? Um, did it feel icky? I'm, con you know, that feeling of being really confused. Yeah, I was just going to add that, I mean, we were talking about how it's not black and white. Um, you know, within Safer, we really like to emphasize that relationships exist on a spectrum. Um, and so, you know, there might be red flags in your relationship and green flags in your relationship. And it's about identifying trends early on so that you can assess the overall trajectory of the relationship. It's about saying, okay, I see this, this is the, something that I love about this person, and this is a great thing. But then also there's this thing over here that we should communicate about and set a boundary around. Um, and so sort of identifying those red flags early on can prevent violence um, um, and that sort of progression of manipulation from even happening in the first place. So thank you for that question. Absolutely. I would add to that, um, I mentioned earlier that it's important for you to know yourself. I think it's also important that you know what you want from a relationship. Like, what does this look like? Um, even having, having been a survivor of IPD, um, I can tell you that you never, it, no matter how much you know, in the moment, you still second guess yourself. However, you will always come back to what you know, right? There's a part of you, and I think Janae mentioned it earlier, like, trust your gut. Like there's a part of you that's going to be like, something's not right here. Not quite sure what it is, but something's not right. The moment you get that, that's the moment you're like, pause, right? Like you have to remember what is it that you want out of the relationship. And if all you want is just to feel good or to have somebody around, then all the other things will happen because you're not paying attention to them, right? So what are all the things that you want out of this? Like every single thing. Because I find, especially with young people, we start out relationships just only one in one thing, and then you stay in them over time, and you kind of forgot why you were there, but then it's just so comfortable. You're like, oh, yeah, this is nice. But then all those flags start popping up, and you continue because what you want out of the relationship you're still getting because you're not considering all the other things that you could be getting out of a relationship. You've only focused on this one thing. So going back to knowing yourself and knowing what is it that you want. And I don't care if that relationship is tonight, next week, the next five years, I don't care what it is. What do you want out of it? If tonight you just want to swing from a chandelier, then you do that, swing the hell out of the chandelier. But if tomorrow you don't want to swing anymore, then you need to know, like come tomorrow, I don't want to swing anymore and be prepared for tomorrow morning, I'm done swinging. And I think, if any of us grew up in households that where there was gaslighting or invalidating of feelings, it can be hard to know how to trust your intuition. You know, there's so many people that tell us just trust your gut. And it's hard to know what that feels like. You know, I remember reading a quote after I was in an abusive relationship, which was sometimes you think the butterflies in your stomach are butterflies, but actually it's your gut telling you to fucking run. So it's just like, you. all of us have the intuition and the gut feeling, but what we need to do is start to learn how to, to listen to it. You know, there's like little tools I have where if I get a feeling about someone where I wouldn't want to invite them into my home, that's one of my tools of knowing whether or not something, or if there was like an inkling when someone texted me that there could be some type of manipulation, because, you know, I'm the type of person to be like, Oh, but maybe they're being nice because I was always taught don't judge, you know, um, but sometimes we have to relearn our intuition. It's always there, but it's how do we learn to listen to it again and how to uncover. Yeah, all that probably like gaslighting we had been in our lives growing up and in our um, teens and early 20s even there's a lot of unlearning to do with intuition. So we have one final question. Um, and then I'm gonna drop an assessment form into the chat. 
and the assessment form is just for our feedback to see like what people thought and any feedback they have about this event. Um, our last question is, how has this conversation affected your desire to support more resourcing um, for BIPOC and other marginalized communities? I think from a personal standpoint, um, and taking this kind of back to my center, um, which is that we want to, I, we're, I would like to schedule a, you know, a queer sex ed, but I think also it's important to schedule a BIPOC queer sex ed, um, to specifically talk about, um, the, the, this unique challenges that by bi, queer BIPOC people, um, experience in sexual health. Um, and so I think that is something I would, I'm going to bring back to the Pride Center. Um, this conversation has really just made me want to continue to collaborate with different campus organizations, team up with Eros and have more events. Um, and it just made me realize there's a lot more we could be doing right now. I was thinking just any kind of information we post for students, we could be tagging the MCC and having them reshare all this to make sure it reaches all the different campus communities and tagging all the different organizations. Um, and I also want to look more into what specific barriers exist for BIPOC Cal Poly students. So then we can address those specific barriers because um, yeah, I, it, it's just made me want to do more specifically with Eros um, for these different communities. Kind of writing on what Autumn said, um, I this discussion just made me really want to go back to Eros and just continue. Our work right now, we do try to make it as general and encompassing as possible, but it would be interesting to see if we could take our work to more specific directions to be more addressing of these issues that different communities are facing instead of just try, trying to keep it general and open about like just STIs and masturbation and all of that. Um, I really loved being here and just hearing everyone's perspectives on, um, you know, an area of sexual health that I, we don't always focus on in violence prevention, but it, it's something that's really important. And so I really hope to take back some of the information that we've been learning here, you know, specifics about contraception um, and things like that. And sort of using those, um, you know, different insights to better tailor our work. Um, and provide those resources where we see gaps. Um, and so I just wanted to reaffirm my gratitude for everyone here um, um, in participating. Yeah, ditto to that. We're currently in the process of designing a donor education program because as is the case with the nonprofit industrial complex, often we are funded by people who do not align with our mission. Um, and this is making me think about the gaps in that programming and ways that we can further explicitly state the gap or the ways in which BIPOC people can't access our services. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think as Ari and Autumn were talking about, there's a lot that we can do within Arrows. Um, and to consider all of the student body's needs and their different um, perspectives and knowledge of sexual health. Um, I think that something we can do is like um, update our presentations and make the information as culturally, culturally relevant as we can to um, just take into consideration like all the intersections and the different um, types of students we have and just the barriers that they have faced previously in accessing the information. Okay, I know we said final question, but we have a couple minutes. So I just wanna ask, uh, this is pretty much what we've been talking about all hour, but just any final takeaways, what would your main recommendations for students to maintain their own personal sexual well-being be? Um, I know we talked about a little bit um, like doing your research and knowing yourself really well, but 
if you just um, could sum up what your main recommendations would be. You know, we've said know yourself really well and acknowledging that to know yourself, you have to learn about yourself. And that is a process and a long process. And that it's okay if we're, you know, we talk about healthy relationships, but build a healthy relationship with yourself, that these things are really intimidating, but they can also be fun. Learning about yourself can be fun. Having time set aside, you know, where you watch a funny Netflix show that also has sex positive messaging, where you do reading that you want to do about things you're curious about, you know, those are ways that you can build a healthy relationship with yourself and with your sex life. I would also add to um, be your own advocate, right? Like, so part of knowing yourself is being able to speak up for yourself and knowing the things that you want. Um, and I can't stress enough, like get tested y'all regularly. Like, I don't care whether or not you've been with the same partner. Can we like, please? Like, I don't trust people the way y'all trust people. And I'm glad y'all do, but please <laughs> take care of yourselves, right? Like. Um, it worries me that we place our trust in other others for things that can affect our own lives. So know yourself, advocate for yourself, and get tested regularly. Yeah, if anyone who's watching the panel now or later hasn't been tested before and it seems intimidating, I will say from personal experience, um, it's part of our job to go to these clinics and be able to assess you know how they're doing so that they can reach the people they need to and the center in Planned Parenthood in San Luis Obispo are gender affirming um, they have bilingual staff and a lot of times they do a lot of work to make the lobby area like nice and inviting it's not um, a scary place to be I recommend when you go in for an appointment and you're waiting in the lobby sometimes they have free wi-fi so you could take like your um, computer or phone with you, have water nearby, so it's really easy to pee in a cup if they need that. Um, and yeah, get tested like once a year. We say if you're in a monogamous relationship, maybe with Dr. Joni Roberts would say more. Um, <laughs> and at least, you know, before and after each partner, there's also a window period. So um, waiting three to four weeks after having after having sex, I would say, especially if it was unprotected sex, wait three to four weeks before getting tested and um, remembering the four core and remembering that those places are free with the F packed card. So you don't even have to remember that. You can just say, hey, I was told about some free card that I can get um, to get free services here and they will help you out. And lubricant is also uh, the answer to most of these questions. <laughs> um, find the right lube for you that will probably help with a lot of things like friction, condom usage, pleasure, comfort. Um, I did want to bring up again another resource which is I'm not sure if this was mentioned but there is testing available from Cal Poly's Campus Health and Wellbeing. Um, it does cost money, it's not free um, and um, there is also just like getting protection, it's available almost universally across much of Cal Poly's campus. I know the Pride Center has it. Um, we have lube, we have condoms, we have all those things. Also, would... there's um, self-testing. Oh, sorry. Oh, that was <laughs> oh yeah. Um, there's also self-testing at the health center available, so you don't have to be, be see a healthcare provider or anything if that represents um, some type of difficulty for you to get tested. Um, yeah, you don't have to. You can just do a self-swab. Um, I believe chlamydia, gonorrhea, and I think the bacterial STIs, yeah. We started talking a little bit about the right lube for you. I also wanted to touch on how we are huge advocates for masturbation because you are your safest partner and it's important to main, hi, maintain hygiene with your sex toys. So cleaning them properly before and after use. Um, look into, again, look into the different kinds of lube, water versus oil-based versus silicone-based for your specific needs and the toys that you're using. So 
Okay, wow. I am blown away. This was such an amazing event. I really appreciate all of you being here and sharing so much great information. Thank you so much for taking the time. I know this is a huge complex topic and there were a lot of things that we touched on. Um, and there were so many great links and things dropped in the chat. So we are going to compile a resource list after to share along with this recording um, for people to have access to. And also Alexis dropped the assessment form in the chat, I believe as well. So if you'd be able to fill that out so we can um, better serve our community for future panels. But thank you all again. Um, I hope you all have a great evening. Thank you so much. This was cool. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for having me too. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.